So good morning, class. Today, me, Sergio, and Andrea will be talking about famous Russian mathematician Sofia Kovalevskaya. So if you don't mind, we would like to go ahead and get it started. And we're going to present to you a YouTube clip describing um, late um, 19th century Russia. Until the second half of the 19th century, Russia remained ambitious and aggressive empire. Um, they were focused on expanding the territory and military power of the state. However, it was also the time for a serious political change, and even though a few attempts to reform the country failed, they paved the way for such important events as the abolition of serfdom, forming the first Russian parliament, and important economic reforms. Um, the second half of the 19th century was marked with the growing instability in the state. Many oppositional parties as well as the terrorist groups occurred. People demand further reforms, constitution, and parliaments. During uh, the Soviet era, most customs and tradition of Russia imperial past were suppressed, and life was strictly controlled and regulated by the state through its vast intelligence. Um, the role of woman was basically finding a husband, reproduce, and then spend the rest of their lives serving. They were not allowed to have a career, and all women were expected to be weak and helpless. Uh, women were controlled by men in their lives, first by their fathers, brothers, and male relatives, and finally by their husband. And um, Sofia Kovalevskaya, she was a very talented woman. Uh, first of all, she was a political activist and um, huge champion for feminism. Uh, she was also a writer, wrote nonfiction and fiction, wrote a couple of plays and autobiography, uh, also contributed to science journals at the time. Um, she also had her hands in physics as she um, wrote about optics, about um, light diffraction going through crystals, and most importantly, she was a mathematician. She was all. Oh. And this is uh, one of her quotes. Many who have had an opportunity of knowing any more about mathematics confuse it with arithmetic and consider it an arid science. In reality, however, it is a science which requires a great amount of imagination. Uh, she was also known as Sonia. Uh, she was the daughter of the General Kukrovsky, and she had an older sister, Anuta, and a younger brother, Fedya. Uh, she was born in January in 1850 in Moscow, Russia. Okay. And um, this part's pretty interesting. It's her early life developments in mathematics. Her wallpaper was actually covered with her dad's calculus notes, and she would study those. That's like her first glimpse into calculus. And um, her father actually did not want her to study calculus. Um, I guess he wanted her to go play with her dolls or something. But um, she actually, against his will, snuck in an algebra textbook into her room and would study that at nights. And in order to learn optics from her physics book, she taught herself trigonometry. That was without a textbook and without a tutor. She would get a cord and tie it around the circle, and she would move it back and forth. And by that, she was actually able to develop the sine wave. And her neighbor at the time, Professor Turtov, was actually really impressed about her actual development and how similar it was to the, you know, the development you find in a textbook. And he begged and pleaded for her father to actually allow her to continue her studies. And um, after a little bit of begging and pleading, her father eventually gave up and um, let her finish her basic studies. Uh, she finished her basic studies in 1867, and then she wanted to continue education, but um, in the system of universities in Russia, didn't allow women. So the only way for her to do that is to travel to Switzerland, but her dad didn't let her go with her sister because they were two women. That was not going to happen. So her sister, Anuta, she, f she was a, real, um, a really strong feminist, so she influenced a lot um, Sophia to, to get a fictitious, uh, fictional husband, and, and he was going to marry Anuta, but he met Sophia and he decided he wanted to marry Sophia. And when they got married, they traveled to Germany to study over there. And even at Heidelberg University, she was still met with a bunch of adversity. Um, it was up to the professors to decide whether she was allowed to attend their lectures. A lot of them actually gave in. And, you know, she was a very firm believer in education for women. 
Um, at the time, she was actually the talk of the university as she was recognized for her mathematical ability. But at the same time, it was strange because she was a, a woman. So, you know, don't see that often, I guess, around the time. And she actually helped her friend, Yula Lermontov, attend classes, who eventually became the first Russian female chemist. And despite all these great accomplishments, you know, people were still looking down upon her. The president of the university was actually very upset with her as um, sh um, he was led to believe that she tricked the faculty into letting Lermontov use the all-male chemistry lab at the time. And after her studies, um, she eventually wanted to further advance them and decided to seek out Karl Weierstrass and in Berlin. Uh, this is Karl Weierstrass. He was a German mathematician. He developed the theory of complex functions and power series, and he was her private tutor for four years. Um, Okay, and it's a quote about um, Berlin at the time. Uh, Sophia said that the capital of Prussia proved to be backwards. Despite all my pleadings and efforts, I had no success in obtaining permission to attend the University of Berlin. Basically, she was expecting you know, a major city to be kind of further ahead as far as social progress is concerned, but it turned out to be not true at all. Um, meeting Karl Weihersrass, um, Karl heard a lot about her and um, through recommendations, um, he set up a meeting with her and he presented her with an exam on hyperbolic functions, which was a class he was currently teaching at the time. He expected for her to do absolutely nothing with it, to fail miserably. And, you know, despite all that, one week she came back. Not only did she have 100% right, but the way she answered the questions, he was totally blown away by that, so it was pretty impressive. He even went as far as to say that um, she was better than, her top, than his top male students. And um, despite all this, despite Weierstrass praise, you know, top mathematician at the time, he went up to the board, asked him if she could attend classes at the University of Berlin, and they gave her a no. So Weierstrass saw it as a personal um, responsibility of his to further teach her and um, decided to tutor her twice a week for the next four years. And, you know, they developed a really deep, strong relationship that went a little bit above the mathematics and would write letters back and forth for like the next five to ten years. Sophia um, contributed to the theory of partial differential equations. Um, she also contributed to the Avelian integrals and she developed um, a model for a top on physics that explained the model of Saturn rings. Uh, she was the first woman to get a PhD in mathematics in Europe and she was um, and she was, she got a PhD and she was a summa cum laude when she, at the University of Göttingen. And if you turn your attention to the board, I'm going to uh, try to explain the cauchy kovalevskaya theorem. Um, basically what it was is that Cauchy developed the existence theorem for partial differential equations. But um, Kovalevskaya took a step further and generalized it, as in Cauchy's case was very specific. So first thing I'm going to do is define a partial differential equation. And that is a, a, a differential equation that contains unknown multiple variable functions and their partial derivatives, as opposed to a regular de differential equation, which deals with single variable functions and their derivatives. And you know they're using physics to help describe certain phenomena, such as sound, heat, fluid flow, and so on and so forth. So if you don't mind, I'm just going to present to you a partial differential equation really quick. Please excuse my handwriting. So on the left-hand side, we have a derivative with respect to z. Well, a derivative of z with respect to x and to y. Set that equal to 4x squared y. And we're trying to find a solution set that fits this uh, particular differential equation. First thing I'm going to do is split up the left-hand side or expand it. So you get derivative with respect to x and a derivative of z with respect to y equals 4x squared over y. And now that we have this set up, we're going to integrate both sides with respect to y. I'm sorry, with respect to x, so I have the integral dx times 
derivative of z with respect to y equals, we're going to pull out the 4y. We're going to treat it as a constant since um, we're, we're deriving or integrating with respect to x. And then we got x squared in here, dx. Take the integral of both sides, and we're left with, yeah, derivative of z with respect to y equals 4y. And taking the integral of that's pretty simple. That's going to be x3 cubed. But at the same time, we're going to introduce an uh, arbitrary function that kind of serves, you know, when you take the antiderivative of a function and say calc 1 or calc 2, you have to kind of have like that plus c. This is kind of serves the same purpose. I honestly don't really understand it all the way yet, but we're going to go ahead and do that. And we're going to call that constant fy. Our next step is going to be to, again, take the integral, but this time with respect to y. So is that fine? Should I erase it and start from the top? If I keep on? Keep it, guys. Whatever way you want to do it. What's easier for you? Do OK. So. Once again, we're deriving, this time with respect to y. dy equals, we're going to treat the 4x over 3 cubed as a constant. And then take the integral of y dy plus the integral of fy. And after taking the integral of that, we are left with z equals 4x cubed, 3. And this one's pretty easy. We get y squared over 2. Um, since this is an arbitrary function, and we don't know what it is, but we are taking the integral of that function, it's going to be something else. So we're going to call this new function h of y. And just as we did an arbitrary function for y, we're going to have to tr introduce a new arbitrary function for x. And we're going to go ahead and call that g of x. So our final answer for a solution to this differential equation would be z of x and y equals 2 thirds x cubed y squared plus h of y plus g of x. And it's kind of like your first glimpse into partial differential equations for most. Going to go ahead and now define the cauchy kovalevskaya theorem. The cauchy kovalevskaya theorem, it's the main local existence theorem for analytic partial differential equations associated with initial value problems. First thing I'm going to do is to find an analytic function. We've dealt with them pretty much our whole entire calculus career. It's a function. Uh, a function is analytic if it can be given by a convergent power series in the form of, and if you paid attention in Calc 2, you should be able to recognize this, mm -hmm. in the form of a n times x minus x naught to the nth power. And um, such examples are polynomials, logarithmic equations, trigonometric equations. And certain things that aren't analytic would be like an absolute value function. And also, this deals with um, initial value problems, where uh, initial parameter is given. Kind of like almost like in um, when we take the integrals of certain things, say um, the integral of x with respect to, I mean, the integral of x. And they say, um, find what it is when f of 0 equals 0. And you know we're solving for c. It's kind of something along those lines. And now that we got that all out the way, once again, it's the main local existence theorem for analytic partial differential equations associated with initial value problems. And then the actual theorem itself, in its simplest form, it's going to be any equation 
of u or root t equals f. And these are all the initial conditions. t, u, x, du, dx. And um, where f is analytic, For values near t naught, u naught, x naught, du naught, dx naught. And also, this possesses only one solution, u, t, and x, which is analytic. near t naught and x naught. And that's pretty much the idea of it. Honestly, kind of went over my head a little bit. Kind of got the grasp of it, but still a little you know, high level stuff for us. But um, this is pretty much her magnum opus, and I felt like it was definitely worth presenting. You know, This is what she's probably best known for. So thanks for your time. After she got her PhD, she was unable to find a job, so she went back to Russia. And she m denied a job that was offered to her because she was weak in multiplication tables. Um, do, to I the top. do I have one minute left? Yeah. Okay, she, she did, one of her main contributions was on physics, on rotational bodies. So before I s explain real quick what she did. Um, a rotational body, well, she studied the procession. Of rotational bodies, which you have, uh, the axis of rotation rotates, and also the body, which is right here. So there were, uh, Lagrange studied and Sophia. Um, they all came up with closed, form, uh, closed forms to solve these kinds of problems. So just as in the second Newton law of motion for linear motion, we have force equals mass times acceleration. And for rotational motion, the ambivalent of that is is the torque um, uh, equals to the in moment of inertia times the angle. The angle is constant right here. And the moment of inertia is just the tendency of the rotational body to resist uh, change in the angular velocity. Um, the angular velocity is just the rate of change of the how, the pos how fast the position changes with an angle. And um, Lagrange, what he did, he studied a body with the center of mass in the, s in the very center of the object, and it was rotating. So it was easy for him to get a, s a closed form to solve that problem because it was all symmetric. Uh, what you o Euler did, uh, he did kind of the same, but he didn't apply any external force on the axis of rotation. And what's different about Sophia, what she came up with, it was that you had um, three axes, and this is the principal axis of rotation, and this is the body which the center of mass is not in the middle and is not located at the at the axis of rotation, and the inertial uh, and the moment of inertia of this axis is equal to this one. I'm going to call this I1, and this is I2. These two are equal, and the principal. Uh, axis of rotation is half of the moment of inertia. So that's, and that's stra a straightforward integration to solve that. It's not easy, but that's what she came up with. I mean, like, pretty much why this is important is that in order to describe the motion of the top, it's very difficult. And most of the times we get ugly numbers and ugly equations. 
And what these three were able to do is just present it in a nice, clean way. So it's you know pretty impressive. And running out of time, so. Can you go back to the slide? And that's pretty much what she drew over. She drew over there. I want to take a look at it. Want to seek help for that, Professor Dugan? Okay. So pretty much, um, despite all her great accomplishments, despite her winning this great prize at the Grand Bourdin for her top, she still couldn't find any jobs around Europe. So she had to renew her professorship in Sweden, which we kind of glanced over, but you can go back and check it out later. Uh, she wrote *Memories of a Childhood* and *A Nihilist Girl*. Both um, published and critically acclaimed after her death. And um, she died because she would frequently uh, visit France to visit um, her lover at the time. She eventually caught pneumonia and it was, caught, it was misdiagnosed way too late. And she died at, in, 19, in 1891 at the age of 41. Terribly young age. So a couple of quotes from her two mentors. And um, as far as her legacy is concerned, despite worldwide eulogies and mourning, the Russian Minister of the Interior didn't approve of so much attention devoted to her, probably because she was a woman. Um, but the mathematical world um, was more generous in its praise. And during her mathematical career, she published 10 papers in mathematics and physics, though many of it has uh, been lost throughout time. And these are our references. Thank you very much for your time. That'd be it.